and welcome to another episode of The Hump with Katie. I'm your host, Katie Thoreau, and I have got an incredible episode for you today with the bassist Derek Hodge. If you're new to The Hump, this is a series where I interview some of the world's most incredible artists and musicians and find out why are they so amazing, how did it happen, what was their journey, and most importantly, what can we learn from them? We've already had some fantastic guests like Christian McBride, Larry Grenadier, Rufus Reed, Justin Coughlin, and so much more. You can find all of these episodes on iTunes, Spotify, and you can actually see them on YouTube. So go follow, subscribe, and download, leave a comment, and hey, let me know who you want to hear from next. Before we get started, I'd love to thank our sponsors. And first up, we've got Colsteins. I love Colsteins, and they're offering our listeners a 10% discount. They are an amazing string shop, and they have two locations in Long Island, New York, and they have a killing online store. And if you go into the store, they're so knowledgeable and so kind, and it's amazing. If you go to Colstein.com and use the promo code KD10, you'll get 10% off your entire online discount. That's Colstein.com. Up next, I'd love to thank Jams World, and I think no wardrobe is complete without a Jams World. Of course, I'm wearing my Jams World right now, and it's one of my favorite clothing companies, and it's been family-owned and operated in Honolulu, Hawaii since 1964. And the reason why I love the fabric and the clothing is because it's made from 100% spun crushed rayon, which keeps me really nice and cool and comfortable. And the artwork is so cool and unique, it's screen printed right onto the fabric. If you go to jamsworld.com and use the promo code JAZZ15, you'll get 15% off your entire online purchase. That's jamsworld.com. Okay, that's enough from me, and it's finally time to introduce you to our guest today, the incredibly talented Derek Hodge. And it's kind of hard to say that he's just a bass player because he's not. If you read his bio, you think that he's 300 years old because he's just done so much. Yes, he's a bass player. He's a composer and arranger and recording artist, but he's an orchestrator and he does film scoring. He's done over 15 movie projects. It's insane how much he's accomplished. And I know he does, he wants to do so much more. And it's also really easy to see after talking with him why people want to collaborate with him. It was a lesson for me in just speaking with him. It, it made total sense why he's played with Mulgrew Miller, Jill Scott, Most Def, Common, all the influences and all the music he plays. Um, it's It was just an amazing conversation. So without further ado, here's Derek Hodge. Good. Happy New Year to you and all that good stuff. Likewise. I love your sweatshirt. I should get, ah, one, thank you. Yeah. I should get one of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. We'll talk about that for sure. Okay. Okay. I'm yeah. good. And you're you're um you're in Colorado, right? I am. I'm in Denver. Nice. I'm awesome. in Denver, and uh, yeah, I was uh, picking up the kiddos today, and just daddy, 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 daddy. I'm like, <laughs> why don't you guys just take care of yourselves? Yeah. You know? <laughs> you're five and seven. It's time to be adults. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I know. I mean, when we were kids, it was like, you know, we were left home alone, you know, almost. Right, like exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Oh, well, cool. Yeah. I'm so excited to have you on The Hump. I kind I kind of oh, ask everybody um, what that means, what The Hump means to, to you personally. The Hump. Wow. It could be so many things. Like, I guess when I hear that now, when people talk about The Hump, something's humping whatever that that beat the, the flow the rhythm the that thing that thing that makes the push a little special whatever that hump is you know mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah i know it's a very like bass players we, we know what it is but, yeah exactly uh, it was kind of hard like people are like the hump what are you doing katie this is uh, <laughs> right. you know, it's pg this is rated yeah right that's yeah. exactly <laughs> Well, awesome, Derek. I'm it's so excited fun. to um, to get to speak with you. You're one of my favorite bass players and um, oh, been fun. fortunate to get to see you play a couple times and be right next to you and, and learn from you. Uh, and it was love the mutual. You are awesome. <laughs> and uh, I got to say, it was kind of difficult preparing for this interview because um, we could talk about just you and film scoring or you and producing or you and composing or orchestrating there's you do so many things and you do it very well and you know not a lot, a lot of people are like that can do that so i'm gonna i'm gonna try and um you know make a full circle with this oh that's all love um so i mean you grew up close to philadelphia right mm -hmm. and how did where because that's a, that's the a hotbed for great musicians right it sure is it sure is yeah, I'm originally from Philadelphia, and um, that the 
West Philly, where I'm originally from, um, my mother used to sing on this choir, uh, really well, amazing choir. Patty LaBelle came from there too. It was like really cool. But the bass player was like, he was insane. Like just incredible. That type of person yeah. that just, you know, you hear him play Joel Ruffin, you know, you hear him play and it's like, you know, it's going to be a good day. It was, yeah. it was, and I want to be just like him. So when we moved, Coincidentally, to this small town, it's Af African American town, and about 20 minutes away in New Jersey, in Willingboro, New Jersey. Little did I know that that would turn out to be just one of the greatest places to live in terms of being in, being creative. You mm -hmm. know, because there were so many musicians around me from a really young age. You know, so I feel like really fortunate. I was always around something unique and cool. Yeah. So between Philly and Willingboro, New Jersey, definitely. Well, and I can hear that in your music. I mean, I was listening to your newest record today mm -hmm. and, and recently, Color of Noise. It's like, um, it's just music, right? It's not like, yeah, it's not jazz. It's not hip hop. It's not whatever. It's just so it kind of it kind of just seems I can hear where you grew up almost and the people you grew up with. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. You know, it's when I start on that journey, journey as, in terms of putting out my own records, I, you know, almost I don't want to say faced with a choice, but there is a, in what we do in the business, you know, uh, we're aware of how we're perceived, you know, and uh, especially when we're trying to make the first artistic statement, going back to live today, there's a choice to be made like, okay, what ask, what perspective, you know, do I want to capture, you know, is it something that is more of a polished perspective where you know, I just go back to a ton of shedding and then mm -hmm. speaking in a way that's very specific to the instrument, you know, regardless of how that turns out. But I was like, okay, that's cool. And maybe mix a little bit of that, but that's not my story. Every time I thought in that way, mm -hmm. you know, it was just like, man, I feel like, no, I'm chasing like records that I feel like um, other bases have done that in an amazing way already. Mm. I don't necessarily always hear things that way. Yeah. I love the bass, but I, most music I write, I don't even write from that the bass at all mm -hmm. or anything. So I was like, let, the biggest risk was that I thought was a risk coming to the, from the first album was let me just trust the writing process, mm -hmm. what feels honest to me. And I didn't even, the more I opened up to that, what sounds honest to my story just happened naturally. So when you say yeah. that, I appreciate that because really, you know, it all seems like always that that's kind of been a thing with with that record and the second and Color of Noise. But for my first album, that was a, a question of, OK, what do I really want to say? Mm -hmm. You know, and I said, let me just let go and give my mind space to create, you know, so thank you. Oh, yeah, t totally. And, and like like the great John Clayton says, it's oh, just a snapshot of you on that day in time right yes yeah yep. i i had to learn you know i've learned so much from john clayton but that was just a huge like okay it takes pressure off well first of all speaking of john clayton i don't think i've ever even fully said this in any interview uh he i thought about him when it went on my first record you mm -hmm. know um the very first time i heard him i was at temple university and terrell stafford who uh, first started playing with the Clayton Hamilton band at certain times and working mm -hmm. with John Clayton's, was it the quartet or quintet? I can't remember. But uh, Terrell put on Emily. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, John Clayton blew me away in such a way. And then when I dug deeper and Terrell told me at that time, yeah, he just finished. He's back in the States, but he just came from yeah. overseas, I think, as a principal for what? What was it, the Rotterdam Symphony or something like Some, that? Yeah, Amsterdam or something, yeah. Yeah, it just made, it was just like, oh, cool. And then when I, shortly after getting out of school, Diane Reeves' album came out, and I was a big Billy Childs fan in terms of arrangements. But when I started tracking and seeing John Clayton was arranging equally as many songs yeah. on that record as him, and how authentic it sounded and how much depth was in it. And it was, in no way did it sound like it was, I don't want to say unbalanced, but it was in a way where it never sounded like it was unbalanced from a, coming from like a bass player's perspective yeah. or anything like that, or overly noty where it sounded like a composer just trying to prove a point. Hey, I can write. Yeah. He sounded so seasoned in it all. And that, that inspired me, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I actually went to LA and 
got a couple lessons with him and uh one of the songs on my first album you know was partly in honor of him I, it's called doxology and i put him oh in i remember yeah i was speaking of those experiences from the sitting in church to even listening to people like john clayton and that's mm -hmm. why i chose to bow that song yeah because i of love him. that that was in honor of him that's why i put him partly in honor of him that's why i put it in parentheses you know oh how so I'm, gl I'm glad you mentioned that that's awesome that's yeah. yeah i was just listening to that actually i love the the bode intro oh thank you shout tracks. out to john clayton man he was he's a bigger influence than than i think he even knows he was on me i have to make sure he knows that i mean if uh i mean he he arranged the national anthem for whitney houston i mean i mean who, <laughs> yeah okay yeah. Yeah. yeah but then then there's you i mean arranging for most deaf at carnegie hall yeah. and yeah. common and it's you're doing it and it's just it's cool for me and other people to see it's like you don't just have to be a bass player i mean if that's what you love to only do that one thing but it's yeah. you know if something speak piques your interest and i want to talk about this because i've heard you talk about this you know like film mm -hmm. scoring just yeah. do a little digging ask some questions and then see where that takes you and don't yeah. and like you said like uh don't be afraid don't be afraid to do that yeah yeah i think that I, I know how things might look on a resume, like it seems like things just fell into place in some type of plan, but really things worked out, honestly, certain things that worked out was just a combination of just asking a lot of questions, not because I was trying to get to any type of place, even on in terms of the music business. Mm -hmm. I just knew I loved that sound and I wanted to get better. I knew what I didn't know. Yeah. You know, and <laughs> I would just ask questions, you know, and opportunities seemed to open up in that way based on relationships where mm -hmm. people seem to acknowledge that hunger you yeah. know and that kind of that kind of has fueled the career side but when i look back and you know i'm reading certain things and it's like it seems like that was all part of the plan but i wish people do that was just me trying to figure out and the opportunity came mm. and then i i just said yeah let's go for it yeah. <laughs> you know but yeah i mean and that, that kind of goes back to my story. I, I was never in an environment where my immediate surroundings was saying, no, you can't do this. Mm -hmm. My mom was my biggest influence and I wasn't around a lot of musicians, but she would put on the radio every night, and just play music of all types. Yeah. And I would go to sleep with it. And she never told me what wasn't cool, even though everybody mm -hmm. in school was checking out maybe certain styles of music or this and that, like it was cool for I felt fine just staying in the band room, checking this out, playing yeah. electric bass in the orchestra and all. And little did I know, just not abandoning that naiveness would kind of forge a career. But yeah, you know, just being yeah. willing, you know, that's the scariest part. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so what came first? I, I think you just answered the question, electric bass or upright? I started on a, a well, I wanted to start on electric bass. Well, between the two, I started on electric bass, but I originally wanted to start on electric bass, but it was too big for my body. So I, uh, <laughs> I ended up starting on guitar. Oh, okay. And uh, for a couple of years, and then at the age of seven, I started on, I switched over to bass. Uh, electric. One of, the, one of those electric bass, yeah. One of those Fender Junior. Oh, yeah. Uh, the powder blue basses. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so then it was one of those things where, uh, things opened up and kind of found me. I, I, they ended up putting me in the orchestra in elementary school. Mm -hmm. And I, it, the only thing available was an electric bass as well as in middle school. So mm -hmm. even though I was playing electric bass, I was around that sound of strings and all that all the time, you know? And yeah. then uh, they had brought over an acoustic and an upright bass from the high school for me to use. And so I just started trying to figure it out from there, but- uh, Just on your own. Like, yeah, on my own in school and in, in, in school. And really it wasn't in terms of acoustic bass, upright bass. It wasn't until college that I essentially had to relearn the instrument in terms of form, mm -hmm. and, you know, and technique and all that. But yeah. So growing up, um, then upright and electric kind of, that was your main instrument? Yeah. And yep. um, what music were you playing when you weren't in school at that time? What did you enjoy playing on the instrument? I played a lot of gospel music. Uh, the, the the my earliest influences actually was 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 rock rock music. I mean, mm -hmm. even to this day, uh, you know, I I tend to love you know 
just the ten, I don't want to say attention to detail, but the uniqueness of like those types of voicings. When I rock from like eighties on, you know, yeah. not going back to the the blurred history and foundation of rock where it was a mix of blues and all that that was developed. I'm talking about things that had really kind of obvious major voicings and all that mm -hmm. stuff. And like what made one song different from the next was the specific voicings from one guitar to the next and that mesh mm -hmm. is what would make things sound so cool. All of that stuff, it just hit me in a way that was so cool that really informed my decision-making because I, I never would just, that I didn't realize because when I would learn other styles of music, um, I would often revert back to that folk element where it wasn't necessarily just about what the chord changes, the quality of the chords are. Mm. It's the specifics of the voicings that are making it yeah. happen. You know, so I brought that information even into when I started learning more about the history, the, the jazz language and stuff and things sometimes, unless it's fully written out, can be blocked to specific, you know, chord qualities where, um, Sometimes the importance of how voicings are working together from specific mm -hmm. instruments to the next may not be as paid attention to. It might be the overall feeling, yeah. but it's like, no, sometimes if everybody's looking at that chord, maybe you don't play that chord that way. Yeah. Play, this, play the block of it and not the upper extensions of the horn players or the other key player or something, make it sound like it does. You know, all that stuff was really a hybrid of things I was listening to early, you know, from gospel to of course r&b rock early hip-hop a lot of sampled music and honestly that was a big influence on me too hmm. there was such obvious samples being used it would be obvious orchestration you yeah. could hear chops and then it was just so cool how producers even back then were just hearing harmonies when you hear what, how, what yeah i have to tell p rock like man when, how are you hearing that you know to, to be able to tell q-tip like that's so cool how are y'all hearing those harmonies yeah. You know what I mean? What made you put Ron Carter's sample over that? Yeah. That, that, that was cool just to hear how other people, producers would take that and make cool music out of it, you know? So even if it's not, it wasn't explained or they knew theory about it, it was hearing all those little differences that be informed my decision-making sometimes when going from style to style. Yeah. And, and I like that side of, of sampling. Like you said, it's like you're asking, how did, how did they do this? And it's maybe not because they don't know the theory, but which sometimes is freeing, right? So like, yeah, there might be like an Ahmad Jamal, he's doing like an F, just an F triad or something, but yeah. they they hear it over D flat, you know? And you're yes. like, whoa, hey, you know? So you've yeah. got the flat 13 there all of a sudden. Exactly. And I think that's such a cool, you know, sampling is a gateway drug to jazz sometimes, right? Because- oh, It was for me. Yeah. It was for me because I, I really didn't, it gave me also the patience because it was when I got into college, you know, it, it that was all the way in, like, you know, yeah. the jazz tradition, specifically what we call jazz, you know, and it was just, it's an adjustment, you know, even just to the sound, the aesthetics of it. And mm -hmm. it, the cool thing was I'd already been hearing the spirit of that in a lot of samples, you know, so it, it made me very just anxious to go back and dig more. It wasn't a challenge, yeah, you know, to appreciate it. Mm -hmm. which is pretty cool yeah, yeah. um so you went you went to temple you went to temple university and you got in a, as a bassist i got in as a bassist yeah was it a classical department no or? it was it was for jazz it was oh, uh, nice. it was for jazz terrell stafford he was right there <laughs> for my audition so yeah. and so like at that point how we we're just talking about that but how deep into jazz were you at that point, uh, I hadn't even fully learned officially like any tunes ever. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't know, like, so I was in the big band in, in high school, but you know, that's specific charts they give you, you know, yeah. when they give you caravan, you're playing, but to dig back and be, to just listen to a tune and be able to just, I hadn't even learned that until college. Actually, when we had to do something for an audition. So I picked some type of blues or something. But it wasn't until college, my, my who became my best friend, George Burton, taught me autumn leaves in the practice room, like on my second day of school. Yeah. It, that was my beginning, yeah. And what was that? What was that feeling like? It was, it was so cool because, again, I appreciated it because I never, at that, I did, 
I didn't listen. To, I didn't play it early enough to hear the the struggles of learning it mm-hmm. so much. So it wasn't. Uh, oh, we're just playing this. Oh man, my high school band A or joint. We used to play. I don't want to play. You know, learning it from a person that was all, that was already playing it really well in mm-hmm. college. You know, just the aesthetics of it was so cool, but also the spirit of it. It was very like familiar. I remember those sounds of samples, and I remember that appreciation, and I remember even those voicings it being similar to a piano song, a gospel record or something. Yeah. And then I started realizing, oh no, this is all related. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know? So I think again, because I listened a whole lot before I got into the theory side later and, and learn about the history of it, I think I appreciated it more, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, so then uh, it was like an extreme. I went from not hearing anything to just <laughs> going yeah. all in, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, Cause you're, you know, an amazing bass player and so technically proficient on the instrument. So was Thank that you. something that you, were you like a heavy practicer or was that something that came easy to you or how did, how did that come about? I, yeah, I've got to say, I, I was always a, a, a heavy practicer, practicer. I also just enjoyed the instrument, you mm-hmm. know, even from playing electric and I was, you know, doing a lot of gigs at that point, at least on that instrument. And, uh, I kind of didn't have a choice, you know, it was like a lot of catch up for me. Like it was, there was no half in for me. I I was fortunate to have teachers like Vince Fay when I got to college, you know, and even Terrell and Ben Shatner, some people like that, who they were honest with me early on. Mm-hmm. I was fortunate to have the, the jazz club board leaps right around the corner where I could sit in and play with Bootsy, ba- Bootsy Barnes. Mm-hmm learn from Mike Boone and Sid Simmons and Mickey Roker. They'd be there on every other night. Yeah. But because of that, there was no way I couldn't hear what I need, needed to get together. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it just forced me to, it was never just college. It was that balance, the beauty of being in Philly. That's another benefit of being there at that time. There was so many things. You had to really shut your ears off to not be influenced by things mm-hmm. going on around you. Yeah. You know, and because of that, that balance of the jazz clubs at night, school during the day, you know, that by default, it forced me to just practice. And I, I kind of had the, the patience for that because practicing long hours was never really a, a, a problem mm-hmm. a issue for me. I just always enjoyed it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, so was it that relationship that you made with Terrell? Did you start playing with him when you were in school or was it did it, that happen later? You know, it kind of happened later while I was in school. Uh, it was like a it was like a contrast, like I, I was learning about jazz. And then I got into the orchestra at Temple, which was really cool as well. Um, but the, my main work at that time was really just the the Philly scene. I was doing a lot of sessions and we were going back to year 2000. So I was doing a lot of albums like the Floor Trees and Jill Scott to music, those mm-hmm. type of records at that time. Uh, and it really wasn't until I got out of school, uh, my, my senior year of, college, I decided to leave tour with Joe Scott and go back to school. And Mm -hmm. that changed a lot of things because then I just kind of had committed to, you know, spending a season of my life just really learning more and just submerging myself in that. It's a big deal. You're on tour with Jill Scott. Yeah, 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 it was. but But it didn't seem like it at the time because it was all so exciting. And I think to an advantage for me, it was all fresh. Mm hmm. So I appreciated it more, you know. Um, but it's a big deal to leave that too. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> um, but that ended up opening up other opportunities. Going back to school my senior year, that's when Terrell and I really kind of hit it off. And from that, after school, I started working with him, and I recorded. Uh, I started working with him and Mulgrew Miller, and then Mulgrew Miller and I were on Terrell's record, and you know I also recorded on Mulgrew's albums from there, but. That's where that direction started happening. It was really from senior year of high school, I mean, of college on. Well, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Mulgrew because I definitely want to talk about him. And I, if you ever have a memoir, it could be called From Mulgrew to Most Deaf. Um, wow. <laughs> cool. I like that. Yeah. I mean, so I like- I, I'm a huge fan of Mulgrew and especially the records you're on with him. Um, would you mind just talking a little bit what it was like playing with him or even how did how did you start playing with him? And just his sound and being around him. Absolutely. You know, my, my history with Mulgrew actually ties into right where we just left off. It's mm-hmm. kind of crazy. 
I spoke about that whole, you can't be in Philly and you have to turn off your ears to not be influenced by what's going on in jazz clubs and, and in school. And I would show up at the jazz clubs and Bootsy Barnes told Mogu Miller about me without my knowledge. Mm -hmm. He saw him at this festival in New Jersey called Cape May Festival and Jazz Festival. And he told Mogu, you need to hear this kid from Philly on bass. And hmm. Mogu, without me knowing, he came, he, he drove an hour and a half to this small club, Chris's Jazz Cafe in Philly uh, to hear me play. Hmm. And that's where we met. And uh, I think that night I was playing with Jonathan Blake, Jaleel Shaw, George Burton. George is the person that yeah. taught me my first uh, stand. So it all relates, you know, so it's so crazy. It's, but that's how Mulgrew and I met. And it, it, I think that was on a Thursday night. We exchanged info. And by that Monday, I was driving to his house mm. to just learn some tunes. I showed up with my suit on and everything. You know? wow. <laughs> it's so funny. Just to play in his living room, you know? Yeah. Uh, and we hit it off and he said, cool. Uh, you want to start next week? And I, I kid you not, seven days later, I was playing at the eight days later, that two, that following Tuesday, I was playing a week with him at the Village Vanguard. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one night Stanley Clark sitting there, another night Ron Carter sitting there. It was mm -hmm. just like immediately just thrown into the scene, you yeah. know. But there's a, so many things I can say about Mulgrew, uh, but in re at his core, his acceptance of us, you know, he had no tolerance for, you know, anybody not really respecting the music, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and he was so beautiful in that way. He would share his thoughts on records and his appreciation for other musicians, his peers and older and even younger people like, like his legacy depended on it. He would, mm -hmm. we would take 15 hour rides, you know, down the West coast doing gigs from Cali yeah. all the, you know, all the way up to Seattle, you know, and just talking about music and just his acceptance, you know, of us and me and Rodney Green and Kareem Riggins, he was so accepting of our stories, you know, he knew we were doing other things at that time, but he encouraged that, you know, mm -hmm. he would say, just as long as you respect this music, I mean, you're here, mm. it's time to go, let's go. Yeah. I, I've heard people tell a lot of stories about maybe older generations not necessarily being as encouraging and all mm -hmm. that stuff. That's not my story. You know, Mogul yeah. was that person that put it in practice. Yeah. Let me expose you to this. Derek, let me kick your butt on a nightly basis. Yeah then I'll see you again next night and I'll see you again next night and pay it forward. So part of my story is connected to him, mm -hmm. you know, he's a special man. And I, I, Robert Glasper, you know, I got to bitch him up. Like he, Mulgrew's a favorite pianist, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, Mulgrew was that same way with him. That was the first time I actually, I think had really heard Robert's music was from Mulgrew. Mulgrew mm. played his album for about three hours in the car, wow. you know, and it was just seeing someone like him go back and let me know that he supports mm -hmm. by checking out my peers and yeah. showing love and, you know, and talking about Robin Moran and hearing him talk about Aaron Parks and Brad Mel. It was just like, Mogu's cool. Yeah. Connected, you know, so that just taught me, you know, make sure, you know, you're, you're reaching back no matter what. My story can't just be mine. Mm -hmm. I gotta make sure I'm reaching back, you know, in any kind of way. And that was another reason why I had Jahari Stampley mm -hmm. on my album, Color of Noise. Yeah. That was his first album ever, yeah. you know. So that, that that was part of the reason why I try to incorporate those experiences in every in the things I do. Yeah, and we may not that might be something we want to do, but we don't think of it. And someone when someone like Mulgrew shows us how to do that without saying it, right? Without saying it, yeah. exactly. They're not like, I did this for you, so you have to do it for somebody else. Yeah. They're just, it's like you're just given this feeling and then you go, you spread it. Absolutely. Terrence Blanchard in a, seri in a, in a similar way. Mm -hmm. Terrence is more outspoken, you know, in an obvious way, you know, so he's definitely got a lot more recognition for that. But I would say at, in the end, Terrence looks out for people too. You know, mm -hmm. he, Terrence not only helped, I, I mean, he put me on my first film. You know, he not only showed me the ropes, he looked out for us on the business tip too. Like my mm. publishing, 
I didn't even have an administrator at the time. They connected me with theirs. They, they wanted to make sure my stuff was set up mm-hmm. so that they could give people like me credit yeah. for things I write and learn about how the industry is. And that is in itself, it was just profound. That profoundly in, affected me, you know? So people like Terrence Blanchard, Mulgrew Miller, like, you know, they're part of my story. Yeah, and, and the other thing is like, they're not asking for anything other than you know, be present tonight on the bandstand. Exactly. Yeah. And I, there's a um, a great story of Ray Brown, because we we I know Ray Brown as like the savvy businessman, right? Yeah. And uh, but before that, it was Dr. Billy Taylor. Like Ray Brown apparently didn't have his stuff together, and Dr. Billy Taylor said, "You know, do you have any songs? Like anything published?" He's like, "Well, I have this this sheet of music. It's not published." And it turned out to be, and he he showed him the ropes, and it turned out to be Gravy Waltz, which was the theme song wow. for Steve Allen's show. Yeah. And then Ray Brown. I did not know the Dr. Taylor's connection. Yeah. Wow. And then Ray Brown gets business savvy, and then he manages Quincy Jones, Modern Jazz Quartet. And then, so it's cool. It just keeps spreading. It's incredible. Yeah, it's just, that's crazy. I didn't know that. But I feel like that's, it's those untold stories, you know, that enough of us need to just, on the platforms like this, we need to share. And start yeah. connecting the dots. There's an underlying uh, aspect of the tradition that that can be passed on as well. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, yeah. other than the obvious, you know, whose sound was some. You know, it's like no, there's other things too. Yeah, yeah. That all kind of relate. Me speaking of Mogru and Terrence, it's not by coincidence that they both had that same affection for Art Blakey in certain ways. Mm-hmm. Art Blakey unapologetically just encouraged them to write on his bandstand, yeah. you know, and trusted their sound, their voice. You mm-hmm. know, I feel like I'm a recipient of that, that spirit of legacy, you know? Yeah. And how cool is that? I think of that being touched by Mulgrew, who was in Art Blakey's band. Yeah. Just, just amazing. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'd love to talk about speaking of Terrence and his influence, um, how you got interested in film scoring. Yeah, I... Because um, how, how many projects have you done now? You know, I've been a, yeah, I've been a part of... Yeah, in one way or another, I have to look now, but yeah, it's probably been about 15, 20 projects at yeah. this point, which I'm thankful for, you know, but I, I've got to say, um, it all kind of related to that whole... Going back to high school, just my mother never said it was weird that I would keep rewinding the credits at the mm-hmm. end of, oh. <laughs> of the film, you know, and she didn't think that was weird. And I'm mm-hmm. just and I, the music, mom, you that's know, where the so best cool. music is. Yeah, I'm rewinding it on the VCR. Yeah. The <laughs> you know? uh, but, you know, those, those were seeds planted, that sound and me playing electric in the, you know, orchestra through middle school and elementary school um and even on guitar just I, I really had an appreciation for harmony and voicings and uh hearing different styles that helped me to appreciate okay how is this knowledge how do you manipulate this knowledge of harmony within these different frameworks of styles mm-hmm. you know is it there's so many ways of approaching it and naturally that kind of happened when I started checking out films you know mm-hmm. and then I came along when, by the time I hit college, you know, Thomas Newman scores were happening. You yeah. know? So there were things like, it wasn't just, you know, the traditional, you know, uh, scores happening. Now you had movies like Shawshank Redemption, you, yeah. know, you know, to mix with listening to a John Williams Schindler's List. Yeah. You know? So I actually, when I really started diving into the theory, I started going to the library and checking out scores hmm. every other day and started writing my own scores out never hearing them play to perform just working them out i started transcribing um uh, uh shimmer's list at the time mm. i just started writing it out and, and practicing and uh looking at principles of orchestration and how these different families of instruments manipulating what i'm seeing on paper how does that that looks like that, but why does it sound like that? And diving <laughs> yeah. into that, you know, yeah. um, the curiosity carried over to when I got out of school. So when I started, when I was working with Mulgrew Miller, 
on the road constantly, I was writing, even mm -hmm. in the dressing room. And Rodney Green, who played drums with Mulgrew on my first gig, you know, I've known Rodney since high school, you know, mm -hmm. so he knew that. He saw me always checking that out. Rodney had to fill in for Terrence Blanchard for a gig. Mm -hmm. Terrence, on that gig, he found out that Terrence Blanchard's bassist couldn't make a gig coming up. Rodney told Terrence, <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah. There's this bassist, you know, aside from I think would work, I, he's really been writing and checking out. And, and he, man, at that, and I was listening to Terrence's scores. Yeah. And I was just around the clock, and another musician just happened to be paying attention to that. And I mm -hmm. had no idea he even referred me to Terrence. Mm -hmm. But that's how I got that gig. And from day one, you know, I was bugging Terrence with questions, just yeah. bombarding with questions, you know, and one thing led to another and eventually a career was forged out of it. But it was really just curiosity and for curiosity's sake, there was no big gimme like, man, I just want to do this. Let me impress this person, impress. It was one of those things where it was just on my mind. I was always doing it and people were paying attention and speaking for me and doors mm -hmm. would open that I didn't know. And that's literally how I got my first writing experience. With Terrence, with Terrence right? With Terrence Blanchard. So uh, Rodney Green was singing my praises and I got in there and I bugged Terrence. I had questions to the point. Terrence brought his film gear out on the road and, you know, started, he took me under his wing and just mm. taught me the ropes. And um, he ended up really went bombarded with a, like three films at one time. And so I flew out to LA Hmm. one way ticket and I just wanted to learn and he said you know what practice on this film while I'm working on these other one, other two and he said all right man you got this this is your film and he put me on my first film Jet, the Jackson Pollock movie wow yeah that's crazy yeah but it's it all relates it's like a, a melting pot of there was no specific avenue it was just trying to just being in the moment mm-hmm at the, and I think maybe I went harder at it too because I knew it cost me something. It cost me what I thought was costing me at that time, leaving the that that mainstream scene yeah. to go back to college, you know. But little did I know it would all kind of come around. Yeah. Circle, you know. That's why I encourage people, and I I talk about it as much as I can, like put in the work, but you know, don't abandon your dreams. If something, you know, piques your interest, you never know. Mm -hmm. how far you can go in it by just peeking at going further into that curiosity yeah and, and like you you're living proof you can always go back like you went back to school you yes. didn't and you didn't leave bass you didn't leave you know yeah. perform live performance yeah yeah absolutely absolutely so well okay this is this has been this is so great i, I don't i just have i think two more questions i don't want to take up too much more of your no, of your time um good. so now i for the last few years, you've been with Blue Note Records, yeah, which is awesome because Blue Note has had this amazing revival with Don Waz, mm -hmm. and uh, I think he's really smart, a really smart person. Uh, mm -hmm. So how did that relationship, again, oh, I think I probably know the answer. It was probably someone maybe recommended you and you were in the right place, but um, so how did that come about? Uh, yeah, so... With 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 Don was it, uh, my connection with him um, started at Monterey Festival, which was kind of cool to be able to talk about that uh, when I did my residency there mm -hmm. uh, a couple years ago. My Blue Note journey started there. I was in we did it. I did a gig in Dizzy's tent with <laughs> Robert Glasper and Chris Dave, the great Chris Dave and Casey Benjamin, and Don was happened to be there. And uh, we finished the performance. I walked off the stage and Don was standing at the bottom of the stage. And he just came and said, it, he was so to the point, you know, you need to be part of the Blue Note family. Hmm. It was that simple. He said, let's talk. Yeah. Let's talk soon. Let's talk like this week. You know, yeah, <laughs> it yeah, was yeah. like that. And I'm so busy looking like, oh, okay, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, and then at that point it was just, let me put all this to the test. Let me follow up. Let's, and that's how it happened. Within like a week, we were on the phone and things started falling into place, which led to, to live today happening, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and that was it, but it, it was just a friendship with Don, a mutual respect from day one uh, 
that started, you know, in such from such an innocent place. He had just joined on Blue Note. Yeah, yeah. Where his first his signings were Gregory Porter and then and then me. Mm. You know, so he had just gotten on. You know, so I appreciated that aspect as well. And I've always, you know, kind of vowed no matter what, I'm going to try to whatever I do attached to the Blue Note. Mm-hmm you know, name and brand and make sure it's something unapologetically honest, you know, mm-hmm. part of what I feel is my story and not trying to just prove a point, but something that I feel will stand the test of time because it's unapologetically my story or whatever yeah. that word, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And Don's been so great understanding that about me from day one, which is why I'm so thankful that he was willing to co-produce Color of Noise with me. Mm-hmm. I wanted him to be a part of this. Just being able to bounce ideas off him, just knowing he's there, just knowing, you know, he was a part of that process was fun, which made me go about it fully with just being in the moment. You know, yeah. a lot of the, the way I recorded that album, that was in a way paying homage to those vintage Blue Note records. We recorded everything pretty much in a day, a day and a half. Um, yeah, you, yeah. I I mean, I read the, the liner notes and like that was completely new music for everybody. Is that right? That was like that, that was. day, that day, but okay. then actually, so there were like maybe two songs I had, uh, previously I met your heart earlier, like a, about a year earlier, I went in the studio and there were two songs that weren't exactly those versions that Jahari may have known. And, and that's about it. Cause I'd recorded some things with Jahari and some other uh, musicians. And then when Don joined on, I said, let me just start from scratch. But I kept that. I wanted to definitely keep a couple of those songs because like you could have stayed, which ends the album. That was from mm-hmm. the original record. That was 15 minutes from me really meeting Jahari. Hmm. Wow. He had walked in the studio, he had his backpack on. Yeah. And I'd sat at the piano and showed him something. And I, I made sure the engineer kept the, had everything rolling. Yeah. And Jahari walked in, he didn't even know he was being recorded. I showed him you could have stayed. And he sat down and, and played it. And that's what went on the record. Mm, oh, that's I wanted, cool. He didn't even know it was recorded. So yeah. I wanted to document that style. So it was that hybrid and pretty much everything else. Yeah, those guys, they're what you hear them reacting to, they're reacting to in the moment. Mike and Justin hadn't played together. You know, Mike Aberg, that's his first time messing with that stuff as well. And most of the music with Jahari. And at that time, he had just turned 18. <laughs> but that was all part of it. I, I wanted it to be, no matter what, a story of trust, not mm-hmm. just you know, me through composing everything. And yeah. I wanted to be something that was about trust in the moment. And it came out in a way that really conveyed a story that I, I wanted to tell, but I I, I love them for that. They they came in and owned it. And yeah. It. And so for a record like that, where you said it was the first time that the band was recorded live mm-hmm. altogether, yep. but then there there is some editing afterwards, right? Actually, normally the answer would be yes, but but for this album, uh, what you're hearing is is just the through, it's just the the full out pass of them playing. And, That's incredible. And and, and it, it wasn't revisited. Wow. It, what you, what people are hearing is the the very first song. So I almost I tried to in certain ways, I wanted to make sure the first song on the album was representative of the first part of the experience. So mm-hmm. what people are hearing. That was actually the first time the guys are playing the song on certain songs. If you listen to, hmm. uh, uh, what song is it? If you listen to 19, you can hear Justin actually, he's hearing Mike Aberg play the chords and Justin's tuning the snare mm-hmm. and tapping, cut up, making sure it's the pitchy. They're reacting to what they're hearing for the first okay. time. Uh, the first song we recorded on the album, uh, The Cost, people are hearing their first time playing that. And that was so beautiful. I wanted Mike Mitchell and Justin Tyson to, you know, after that song was done and we moved on, I I love how they accepted that beauty of it. It was like, oh, yeah, oh, we're accepting what it is, what we have to say. It's not like we're going back and trying to polish it. And yeah. So that was by design. And because of that, I think the rest of the album flowed in a way where everybody just took ownership in the vision. Because what they had to say was just, that valid and that important to it. Yeah, I love it. And I, it, it's, it's a very freeing record to listen to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you. So the color of noise, mm -hmm. what, what does that mean to you? It's a question. It's a question mark. It, it's actually, it's something that I hope over time leads to that question more and more mm -hmm. because I like to answer that by just, that is exactly what it is by design. It's the question mark of what I am, you know, uh -huh. instead of that's, that's kind of been the defined, the, the thing kind of has been the underlying, you know, thing about me is just, what am I? And I would even ask myself that, yeah. you know, but it just became, you know, a thing of acceptance. When I started hearing from people, how much message of hope spoke mm. to from my first album, Live Today. And that was when I felt like I was at my most exposed hmm. around hmm. different instruments. And, you know, I was like, people reacted to that song of all the songs. It was yeah. like, let me keep going that direction. Mm -hmm. you know, not trying to figure out, let me give people the best, best version of what I think they want to hear in terms of a specific aspect of me. Let me just serve the people best and Blue Note best and myself best by being unapologetically honest to what I'm feeling in the moment mm -hmm. and in this season. Um, and that's what led to Color of Noise, just completely letting go. You know, I'm a composer yeah. uh, by nature as well. So even though it would have been a little more time consuming, consuming, right, being very noty with what I'm writing out, that is the, that would have been the easier way out mm -hmm. well, for me. Yeah. I'm going into a situation where I know these amazing musicians are playing together all for the first time. The easy way I would have been to give them less to have to think about in terms of choices. Yeah. Uh, so for me, it was about, let me put it all on the line. Yeah. You know, like put people in a room that represent different aspects of, you know, me and my history, that innocence of Jahari, that hybrid, you know, uh, you know, all of a sudden, you know, people are, you know, learn about Jahari now, which is great. But it was that thing of, you know, Jahari was just shedding, figuring it out, figuring, yeah. you know, and ended up in a cool situation in New York, you know, versus that producer side of Justin Tyson with his balance and his mix of all the things he does, mm -hmm. you know, and to just to that freedom of Mike Mitchell, you know, to the beauty that is Mike Aberg and all that he does, you know, yeah. it's just like mixing all those sides. And, and Mike Aberg also understands you know, my appreciation for specifics. Yeah. You know, I might not write it out because I want them to feel free, but there are certain emotions that are connected to knowledge of voicings and awareness and knowing there are different ways of improvising. Improvising isn't necessarily always just seeing chord changes and doing your own thing over it in very specific ways and solo wise. Yeah. Improvising can say, how many ways can I maintain the harmony and the voice leading of these chord changes? But then honor that, but still be unique in each way I approach yeah. it. That's improvising too. Exactly. Improvising to me yeah. just taking, taking whatever is in front of you, take whatever that is, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> and, and making something of it. You know, like improvising in life. What period? And Mike Aberg understands that side. So it was just about putting musicians in the room and putting that to the test. The question mark of how are we going to land on our feet? Well, and that must have that. been so exciting yeah. as the composer. Yeah. It, you you know, obviously you have something, you hear it and you've played it on piano and bass and all that, but then to yeah. hear it come out and I, I have a feeling like you didn't tell them anything, right? No, no, absolutely. And, and that was by design. And yeah. that, that was the biggest question mark because, you know, after the first song, you know, if you don't want people uncomfortable to the point <laughs> then that like, okay, they're not happy with what they're, spe what they're speaking. This is all a cool idea, but it didn't happen. Yeah. You know, they, they could have been like, oh, or nerves, because that was all the risk. But after that first song, I mean, there wasn't even like a, we didn't even ch check, having a great engineer and Keith Lewis help where you can do that and just go in there and start playing and not yeah. spending half the day getting your sounds right. Mm -hmm. um, but that's where the production side of myself, you know, kicked in. But really the, the question mark in it all was, how how are we going to land on our feet? Yeah. But no matter what, I was trying to just, you know, be free in that way and figure out what we make of it. What is noise? You know? Yeah. What is, yeah. And it, and it, by, the, by design, it's about to, it's supposed to be that question mark that people hopefully keep asking themselves what I was thinking, what they're thinking. And yeah. the resolve is how does it make you feel? 
Mm-hmm. You know? Oh, well, I absolutely love it. And um, I mean, all, all your compositions, um, right. w- World Go Round, and I love oh, uh, the, <laughs> the little tone poem. Wow, thank you. Because it's, it's fun. I mean, you listen without, head- if you listen to something without headphones, it's like, you hear it one way and then you put headphones on and then you hear, I love hearing what's in the background and what's being said. Oh yeah. And then I, I think, I think it's your wife telling your kids like, Oh, that's yeah. the light. Yeah. 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 All of that. Yeah. yeah that's little tone poem is a series of voice memos. Just the Mike and Justin, eventually you hear Mike uh, Mitchell and Justin Tyson playing drums, but it's a series of voice memos all right here in the house. Me playing mm-hmm. the piano and them talking. and Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Um, well, Derek, I, we could probably do part two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, but I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna cut it here because this was so satisfying. Uh, um, I, I wasn't long winded. I just, I, I like. Talking. No, I, I love this. This was, this I was amazing, it, you know? fantastic. You have best regards from. I just spoke with Justin Coughlin. He said, "Please tell Derek." I said, "Hello." Oh my gosh, Justin Coughlin. That's another. You produced him. produced I, I, his I, record. I love Justin. Me too. Justin, um, you know, he influenced, he, what he, how he explained to me how he, what he gets from, you know, my comp- composition, my music and my art. It, I think, you know, as time goes, I realized how much that impacted the trust you know, that I had to just keep going that direction. When you realize, okay, it's actually speaking to people, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, sometimes that can be everything. You know, for me, that was my mother. Just say, hey, go, keep going. Like, you know, I don't know what you're figuring out right now. You keep making that mistake here and there, but keep going. Yeah. (laughs) But that ended up making me, uh, generally speaking, an unapologetic person and saying, look, I don't want to ignore what I have to say, you know, Mm -hmm. but at certain times, you some people come along to just kind of say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing, I, I hear it, it's speaking to me. And Justin Coughlin was that person. Um, even from when we met, I did. I was doing a duo gig with just myself and Mike Mitchell on drums. And Justin came with his management to the Blue Note and they told me they wanted me and Quincy Jones to produce his album, co-produce his album. And it, I was blown away. I was just like, yes, when, yeah. when do I sign up? You know? Yeah. But when Justin further explained that, you know, he listened through the second, you know, my mm-hmm. second album. And he was very specific on the songs that spoke to him. And he brought up transitions. And that was crazy because transitions happened to be the very first thing I wrote. Yeah. The very first thing wow. I recorded. You know, that wasn't the first song on the album. He spoke to the, the song that had, it's the shortest song on the album, but that happened to be the genesis to a lot of things that happened. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he said he actually saw colors when he's, you know, and, it just spoke to me in such a way. It was just like, oh man, you know, thank you. You know, yeah. so Justin Coughlin, it was an honor to co-produce that album, you know, with the great Quincy Jones for Justin and the trust he had and, you know, allowing me to help, you know, shape his vision and the vision of that band. It was awesome. But I'm telling you the experience I had even with producing that album was incredible. It's because of him that I got to sit with the great Quincy and. Mm-hmm side by side and the shared thoughts sitting right next sitting in a room where Michael Jackson recorded yeah. you know it was, it was special so you know I'm, I'm one of his biggest fans he's blown <laughs> me away with these solo piano pieces he's been putting on social media and yeah I know some of my music and I, I may or may not have shed a tear <laughs> when he did that. but I love him you know he's a special he's a special mind yeah for sure I love him too yeah um Derek. Actually, Mogu, Mogu loved him too. Oh, I know. I, 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 I did one of these with Justin too, and it was really cool to hear about their relationship. But you're, yeah. you're doing it. You're. Thank you. You're reaching back, and you know, giving now. Thank you, thank you, Katie. And listen, like I said, I'm a fan of yours as well, and I appreciate. It. I'm glad we got to do this. Yeah, me too. Oh well, thank yeah. you so much, Derek. Um, continued perfect health for you and your family. And uh, I'll be playing your record. I'll put the links down to everything. Oh, but oh, one last question. Is there anything you're working on now that you want to let people know about? Yeah, yeah. Well, I want people to know more music is coming. I'm, I'm already mo- moving on to my next record. So uh, stay stay tuned for what's going on. 
uh, also working on a, a composing a film, uh, composing a series. Me and my brother Robert Glasper, uh, it's a, a series that's coming out on Stars this spring called Run the World that we're uh, co-composing. So I'm excited about that. I'm actually, you know, like a month, month and a half deadline to do like Ooh. nine episodes. So that's a lot of music. So yeah, yeah, but. I'm, I'm really excited, but just people stay tuned. Thank everybody for, you know, supporting this Color of Noise music and on DerekHodge.com, there's, you know, info, especially when things open up, we're going to get this festival going in Denver. And I want to see as many people there as possible. <laughs> so stay tuned. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Derek. I really, really appreciate it. And um, continue to be safe and healthy and thriving and making music. Thank you. Thank you. All love to you. All right. Bye. Yeah.